After dozens of videos published covering a variety of Cold War events, structures, and people, it has come to our attention that not everybody out there in YouTube land is aware of the history and structure of the Soviet government. So of course, we felt we should rectify that and cover exactly that topic. But as we looked at how to approach this topic, we were quickly reminded that the Soviet Union was in reality a new country, only having been formally created in December of 1922 and was effectively the first large-scale government formed around Marxist ideology. So this resulted in many changes as the nation matured. Then came Stalin, where much of the focus of government lay with him personally. It's only after the death of Stalin, not the movie, that the Cold War era government of the USSR really developed and presented itself. So today we're going to look at all of those developments to give you, our viewers, a better appreciation of the structure of the Soviet government. I'm your host David, and this is The Cold War. Okay, so as just hinted at, it's worth stating outright that the design, politics, and system of governance of the Soviet Union was a historically unique phenomenon. From the outset, the Soviet state was governed by a system of relationships that was different from both democracies and despotic regimes. For the first time in history, a force had come to uncontested power that was willing to completely rebuild society, the state, and even the world in accordance to Marxist theories of power. In essence, it was a project that lacked any predecessor to give it a template to work from. What resulted was a combination of brand new structures of governance with seemingly new structures that were suspiciously close to the same state structures that were being replaced. As any early Soviet historian will tell you, one of the challenges that early Soviet leadership faced was that Marx did not specify how the transition from a capitalist state to a communist state would occur or even what structures would be needed in order to accomplish the transformation. Lenin picked up some of this slack and gave more direction, suggesting that the revolutionary struggle and then after 1917, the revolutionary change should be directed centrally by a communist party. But although this gave some direction, it still lacked details like a system of governance or the structures needed to carry out the changes. Okay, so with all that being said, let's get into some specifics about different executives and legislatures and how they cooperated as well as the role of the Communist Party and its interactions between Moscow and the regions and republics. On paper, a division of power between the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government existed, with regular elections being held for the legislative branch. However, in practice, most of the power was actually held in the structures of the Communist Party as Lenin had proposed. In the early days of the USSR, there had existed an almost dual leadership between the party and the various Soviets, the elected bodies of worker organizations or territorial units. By the mid-1920s, however, all of that power had been consolidated inside the Communist Party. Now, the Communist Party was made up of a number of key structures, many of which you have probably heard of. Most notably are the Politburo, the Central Committee, and the Secretariat. So the Central Committee was the governing structure of the Communist Party and was the main decision-making body within the party during the periods in between party congresses, during which Central Committee members were elected by the membership of the party. The Politburo, or Political Bureau of the Communist Party, had been formed in 1917 and was a seven-member group elected from the members of the Central Committee. Its purpose was to decide on urgent matters on an ongoing basis when the Central Committee could not meet. Over time, the number of members sitting on the Politburo would vary, but it quickly established itself as the most important and influential structure in the Soviet Union, barring a few specific periods. The Politburo, by its nature, brought together the most powerful, influential, and popular party politicians in the country. And with that came intrigue, backstabbing, and alliances for political and personal expediency that would rival any game of Crusader Kings, right down to allegations of trying to assassinate a pope. This brings us next to the Secretariat of the party. This was the body responsible for the coordination of the party's work and of its various cadres and of its administration. 
The position of General Secretary of the Communist Party, originally called the All-Union Communist Party until 1952, was established in 1922, and although on paper the position only led the Secretariat, in practice the holder of the position was the de facto leader of the Soviet Union. Stalin, the first holder of the office, used it as a springboard capitalizing on the strong party links it provided to consolidate power after Lenin's death. It also allowed Stalin the opportunity to run the country single-handedly as an authoritarian, with no need to reach consensus with anybody except his own mustache. After Stalin's death in 1953, the inherent power of the general secretary did start to change somewhat as it shifted more towards collegial decision-making. Don't get us wrong, the decision of the general secretary was as good as law, but some forms of opposition could appear something that would never have happened during the Stalin years. For example, Khrushchev faced a revolt in 1957 from his colleagues in the Presidium, as the Politburo was called at the time. Unhappy with the steps he was taking towards decentralization of industry, during a meeting of the Presidium, his rivals moved to remove him from office. Khrushchev objected to the movement, stating that not all the Politburo members were present, and then began gathering Central Committee members to join the meeting. Members of the Central Committee had this right, and when enough loyal Central Committee members had been gathered to the Kremlin, a snap party congress was called, where the anti-Khrushchev faction was defeated. We should also point out that Nikita had the army on his side, but one of the primary takeaways from this was that everybody played by the established political rules. Okay, so the General Secretary, the Communist Party, and their associated structures were the most important political bodies in the Soviet Union. But the USSR also had a government that existed separate from the party. It was first established as the Council of People's Commissars, Sovnarkom, in 1917. It was renamed the Council of Ministers in 1946. Headed by the Premier, they were the official head of government but only some, not all, premiers of the Soviet Union were also the general secretary of the party, and therefore a leader of the country. Stalin and Khrushchev both held both offices, but later Soviet leaders did not. The Soviet government itself was responsible and accountable to the Supreme Soviet, which was the Soviet parliament, the legislative branch. The Supreme Soviet was made up of elected officials from across the USSR. Of course, the devil being in the details, only pre-selected candidates could stand for those elections, and those candidates would stand unopposed. The Supreme Soviet was then responsible for carrying out the decisions and directions made by the Politburo over all matters of governance, including the economy, education, healthcare industry, security, and such projects as the preparation and execution of five-year plans and the like. The aforementioned Council of Ministers consisted of the Premier, his or her deputies, ministers, the heads of state committees, and the Premiers of the Soviet Republics. The Supreme Soviet itself was composed of two chambers, each with equal authority. The first was the Soviet of the Union, and was made up of one deputy representing each 300,000 citizens. The other chamber of the Supreme Soviet was the Soviet of Nationalities. Since the USSR was a multi-ethnic state, the Soviet of Nationalities represented the various republics, autonomous regions, and ethnic groups within the Soviet Union. The Supreme Soviet, although the highest legislative authority in the USSR, was effectively a rubber stamp for legislation passed to the Presidium by the Communist Party. The Presidium was the body that regularly met to pass legislation and was made up of elected members from both chambers of the Supreme Soviet. Now, as for the relationship between the party structures and the Supreme Soviet and its organs, well, the party clearly led the hierarchy, being the decision makers, the policy setters, and the arbiters. The Supreme Soviet was then responsible for carrying out the directions, but were definitely second fiddle. Second balalaika? Well, you know what I mean. Like the party, government apparatuses underwent some changes after the Great Mustache died in 1953. Khrushchev began a series of reforms with the aim of decreasing the amount of bureaucracy in order to help boost economic and agricultural growth. He allowed for some economic decentralization, with some local decision-making being allowed by the republic governments. 
1957, he established 105 Soviets of the national economy, the Sovnarkhoz, transferring management functions away from the ministries of construction and industry and to those Sovnarkhoz. Along with that, some economic planning authority was moved away from the state planning committee to the planning committees at the republic level. Khrushchev also introduced reforms to the Central Committee and the Politburo, proposing that one-third of each structure would need to change after each term, and he also proposed term limits. These reforms were all rolled back after he was forced to resign. Now, one last piece to this puzzle to discuss. From the Western perspective at the time, it was easy to think of the Soviet Union as this monolithic ethnic state. Soviet Union and Russia were often used interchangeably. But the Soviet Union was composed of 15 republics. It's the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, right? And as well as dozens of autonomous units, each with their own set of relations to Moscow. Many of these are far more well known now as they became independent nations after the collapse of communism, but in the days of the Cold War, each of these territories had their own government structures, largely mirroring the federal structures. The republics each had their own communist party with their own first secretaries, who acted as the leader of the republic. They had their own council of ministers, ministries, supreme soviets, presidians, etc. Despite the efforts of Khrushchev to devolve some powers from the center to the regions, the relationship between Moscow and the republics, though, remained fairly constant after Stalin's demise. And by that, we mean that the center absolutely dominated the regions and their decision making. This was a centralized state, after all. Okay, so we can see that the Soviet Union had many features and structures that, on the surface, seemed similar to the democracies of the West. There was a division of power, there were elections, there was regional governance. In practice, however, all of this was dominated by the unelected Communist Party of the Soviet Union. The elections weren't free or fair, and the regions were subservient to the center. Efforts to reform this were attempted several times. The first by Khrushchev, which led to his demise. The last was led by Mikhail Gorbachev, and it resulted in the demise of the Soviet Union. But you know what? That is a story for a future date here on The Cold War. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode, and to make sure you don't miss all of our future episodes, please make sure you subscribe to our channel and have a press the bell button. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com, and we're active on Facebook and Instagram at The Cold War TV. If you enjoy our work, your financial support would be greatly appreciated via www.patreon.com slash the Cold War or through YouTube membership. This is the Cold War channel, and don't forget, the trouble with the Cold War is that it doesn't take too long before it becomes heated.